People thinking, nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we take a close-up look at a recently released article. That correlated more than 60 studies about health risks to small children who live within five kilometers, three miles, of a nuclear reactor. In our talk with Dr. Ian Fairley, the British-based author of that study, he drops a real bombshell about the international struggle it took just to obtain his data from the nuclear industry. Learn the truth about what kids face if they live too close to a nuclear reactor. It's important information that we all need to deploy in our battles against nuclear reactors. That interview, plus news, numbnuts of the week, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doc and cover report, will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, August nineteen, twenty fourteen, and before we start the news, a heads up. I've been telling you for several weeks now. That the hearing in the case between the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan, who were hit with heavy radiation from Fukushima Daiichi, and Tokyo Electric Power Company, was scheduled for today, August 19. However, we learned late last week that the date has been switched in federal court to next Monday, August 25. I will be in San Diego to cover the story and will file my report in time for next week's nuclear hot seat. All things being equal. I'll also include interviews with the attorneys, the sailors, and any other individuals of interest who pop up. That's next week on Nuclear Hot Seat. But now here's this week's anti-nuclear news. Starting off this week in Japan, where a press conference at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan on August 19 continued to make the case that Fukushima is already much worse than Chernobyl. Toshio Yanagihara, the attorney representing Fukushima children and their parents, told the assembled reporters that comparing thyroid cases after Chernobyl in Belarus with the present situation in Fukushima, there are 14 times the rate of children with thyroid cancer in Japan as there were in Russia. In the western part of Fukushima Prefecture, about one fifth. To one quarter of the people there were found with thyroid cancer. Yanagihara took on criticism directly by saying that these massive numbers are not because there were more thorough screenings, but because there are genuinely are more people with cancer. The former is the argument that government officials are stating as to why the numbers of thyroid cancers are showing up at such a high level. The Fukushima Committee in charge of researching thyroid cancer admitted for the first time on June 10th of this year that the suspicion of malignancy is due to lymph node metastasis, which was commonly found after the Chernobyl accident. In Fukushima right now, the number of children found with thyroid cancer is moving forward much faster than it was in the Ukraine after Chernobyl. Yanagihara said Fukushima is a war zone. Children have a right to be evacuated to a safer place. In Japan, this present situation is the most harsh child-rearing situation in the world. He concluded by saying, "We would like to take this case to the International Criminal Court and are preparing for that." Calling the Japanese government's treatment of Fukushima's children a crime against humanity. A lot of bad news, but honest information about what's happening at Fukushima came out this week from the IRSN, which stands for the French Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety, and is considered that nation's public expert in nuclear and radiological risks. 
in their publication, Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, an interview with Brad Sample, who is an ecotoxicologist, had him stating, the event at Fukushima Daiichi is unprecedented in scale and duration. His colleague Didier Champion said, Japanese authorities measured 15 million becquerels per square meter of cesium-137, for example. This is comparable to what we see in the most contaminated areas around the Chernobyl accident. Researchers have mapped the contamination of the soil, and it goes far beyond the evacuation zone and extends more than 80 miles away to agricultural and urban areas inhabited by hundreds of thousands of people. Jacques Repoussard, IRSN Director General, said, 60 kilometers from the power plant, farmers organized themselves collectively to measure contamination on roadsides, in fields, and even within homes. Along this road, the dosimeter shows a gamma-wave radiation level at more than 50 microsieverts per hour, a tremendous level akin to the highest contamination from Chernobyl. It will be interesting to see whether any of the major publications in the world, most notably the New York Times, which maintains a bureau in Tokyo, will finally stop saying that Fukushima Daiichi is the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. Chernobyl's the younger sibling to what Fukushima has become in terms of nuclear disasters. Continuing with the interviews from the IRSN, Tim Deere Jones a UK-based marine radioactivity consultant, said, The current marine environmental monitoring regimes in the relevant sea area are focusing on a very small number of radionuclides, primarily cesium, iodine, and strontium. These represent less than 10% of the total inventory of radionuclides. I can see no justification for refusing to investigate the concentrations of approximately 90% of the radioactive material. There can be little doubt that a range of other isotopes includes probably four or five isotopes of plutonium, three of uranium, and also americium and curium. They have been released and entered into the marine environment. Back to IRSN. Director General Jacques Repoussard, who said, It is obvious that for a long time, fishery products from the Pacific Ocean will have to be monitored in a rather large area. Why? Because even if radioactive pollution is concentrated in a small part of the Pacific Ocean, behind is the beginning of the food chain. Building on that theme in a broadcast on CBC radios on the coast, Jay Cullen, marine chemist, oceanographer, and associate professor at University of Victoria's School of Earth and Ocean Sciences, said, Models that actually predict the distribution of ocean currents that are carrying contaminated seawater from the March 2011 disaster suggest that the highest activity of these radionuclides that can present health hazards are due and arriving on our coast now and that these concentrations will increase over the coming couple of years. So understanding these concentrations and the timing of the arrival of this seawater plume that's affected is really important for determining the impact on the marine environment and also the health risks for residents of Canada. No word on any comparable awareness or call to action just south of the border in the United States. In what's starting to sound like a Japanese radiological version of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, scientist Junko Nakanishi has been charged with determining the proper radiation level that would allow the displaced residents of Fukushima Prefecture to return home after decontamination. Nakanishi A fellow at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology said, It's about time to think of ways to live under a certain level of risk. The government did not set a specific radiation goal for decontamination, but settled on a threshold instead, stating that the main condition for lifting an evacuation order is that the annual radiation dose must be 20 millisieverts or less. 
An annual dose of one millisievert has meanwhile been set as a long-term goal for decontamination without a specific time frame. Nakanishi said that the 20 millisievert threshold is too high for many residents to accept, but that the one millisievert figure is unrealistic in heavily contaminated areas. She proposes a maximum exposure level of 5 millisieverts per year as just right. Her justification? Quote, Somebody has to find a common ground where people can return to their homes as early as possible. We need to set a goal for radiation. No, Ms. Nakanishi, we need to get those people resettled permanently someplace far away from Fukushima and stop pretending that there is any safe way to resettle people in that permanently contaminated portion of the earth. And if that wasn't crazy enough... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. At the Grand Hyatt Fukuoka, there's no need to worry about radiation in the fish, the water, the soil, the food, none of it, because the executive chef is registered as a Fukushima supporter chef to fight harmful rumors. Ernst Jake, who has been a Fukushima supporter chef since January 22nd of 2014, serves agricultural products from Fukushima and enlightens consumers by making the most of the information provided by Fukushima prefectural government. Mm -mm -mm. Num num eat em up. Of course, he forgets to tell them that it's impossible to have truly raw sushi anymore because the radionuclides in the fish cook it from the inside out. Meanwhile, if anybody owns stock in Hyatt or stays at Hyatt Hotels, you might want to let them know what this branch of their company in Fukuoka is doing to the people who try to eat the food there. And that's why, Ernest Jake and Grand Hyatt Fukuoka, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Over to the U.S., where France's IRSN had bad news for us as well. According to them, cesium-137 levels increased between 1 million and 10 million times in the States after Fukushima. Nice to get this information when there's no time to do anything about it. In this week's Nuclear Regulatory Commission, duck (laughs) and cover report, At the Millstone Power Plant in Waterford, Connecticut, the NRC says it found three violations, three more in a long list that has been growing. And at the Turkey Point reactor near Miami, a so-called non-emergency reactor trip and steam dump may be related to recent high gamma radiation spikes. And remember... This was only a few days after the turkeys at the NRC gave Turkey Point the go-ahead to operate with hotter, cooling water. (laughs) Residents organized for safe environment and San Onofre safety, two activist groups in Southern California, have joined together to issue a report on the problems with proposed dry cask storage of the nuclear waste at San Onofre. This is a mere preview of what every other reactor in the country will be facing as we get them shut down. There will be a link to the full article up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode 165. Even when we shut them down, we're not out of the woods yet. Bad news for horse lovers that may or may not be connected to radiation. A mystery illness outbreak affecting horse communities in California Show the animals with swollen eyes and lips, blisters, burns, lesions spread over most of their bodies, and in one case of a national champion, her entire first layer of skin all over her body in the process of falling off. Experts say they haven't a clue as to what is causing this mystery illness, but considering reports of horse deaths in Japan, And the fact that radiation that came over in the plume would have landed on grass, meaning grazing land, perhaps we've just provided the experts with a clue. For our international roundup, South Korea is running out of space to store its spent nuclear fuel, with some of its storage facilities set to reach capacity by 2016. 
According to Public Engagement Commission Chairman Hong Du Xiong, we will have to stop nuclear power generation if we fail to find additional temporary space. In Australia, a nationwide hunt is underway to find somewhere to store 28 containers of nuclear waste due to be returned to Australian shores by the end of next year. The waste will be shipped back to Australia from France and the UK by the end of 2015. The search to find a place to store this toxic garbage follows Aboriginal peoples of Australia's successful fight to cancel an illegal agreement to store the waste on Aboriginal land at the Mukety Station in the Northern Territory. Now Australia is looking into the far outback to see who they can bribe into taking the stuff, because any place civilized is operating out of NIMBY. And here's a truly scary article from World Nuclear News, written by a man named Ron Cameron. To support the nuclear industry's future, he suggests that they need to satisfy the multi-criteria approach to risk that banks take when they decide whether to invest in large infrastructure projects. Cameron suggests our focus should be on trying to get banks into plant life extensions. He says the banks should be funding the cost of upgrades needed for plants because the construction costs have been amortized, and yet the reactors could run for another 20 years. This, despite the fact that they were designed to be run for 40 years and then decommissioned, Cameron goes on to say, if banks became familiar with nuclear industry issues, then they could one day be willing to join a consortium in new build projects. And he closes by saying. It is up to the consortia of countries that are in favor of nuclear power to have more of a say on the banks' boards. Looks like those evil nuclear industry think tanks are earning their thirty pieces of silver. We'll put up a link to the article to see if anyone's got any idea how to derail this strategy. We'll have the featured interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. Did you know that some listeners have chosen to provide recurring payments through PayPal? It's an easy way to make certain small monthly affordable amounts add up to a major annual donation. Just by dedicating the cost of a single Starbucks mocha choco latte with a side of Creole Lady marmalade, you'll be going a long way to covering each month's bandwidth charges and so much more. So if Nuclear Hot Seat ever makes you laugh, think. Helps you understand the nuclear issues and not be so alone with your awareness. Help us to keep doing this job. Go to nuclearhotseat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red donate button, and know that we thank you for the help you can give. A few weeks ago, a major article appeared that correlated data from over 60 studies in Europe. About the health impact on children who live within five kilometers or three miles of a nuclear reactor. Together, they prove that living close to a nuclear reactor causes a 37 percent increase in the number of childhood leukemia cases. Today's guest is the author of that report. Dr. Ian Fairley is an independent consultant on radiation risks and a former scientific secretary to the UK government's committee examining radiation risks for internal emitters. He joined us via Skype from France, where he was vacationing. Please be patient, because at one point Skype became more Skypeish than usual, and there was an echo recorded on the line. I've edited it out as best I can, and know that if you can bear with it for just a few minutes, it eventually ends. Ian Fairley, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure to be here. Let's start out with giving people an idea of your background. My main degree is in radiation biology. In other words,、uh, the effects of radiation on cells and tissues. Before that, I was a chemist at the University of Western Ontario in Canada.、And、my postgraduate studies were in. How best to deal with radioactive waste, and that was at Imperial College here in London. After that, I entered the civil service and、uh, worked for the Department of Environment and the UK government for about ten years, I suppose. And after that, I retired. But during my previous,、uh, shall we say, life before I started studying radiation biology, I actually worked for Greenpeace Canada 
as um, an advisor, a science advisor to them on their various campaigns. So you could say I've had a pretty rounded sets of experience in, in terms of both an academic and a civil servant and also a Greenpeace campaigner. It seems that scientists like to consider themselves outside of politics, at least when they are putting forward the information that they do. Do you consider yourself anti-nuclear as a political stance? Yes. Basically what it is is that uh, a long time ago I became fairly certain that the increased leukemias that we see in the neonuclear power stations came from their discharges. And I thought that it was unconscionable, just totally wrong for kitty wakers, the little kids, to be dying from leukemia because of us generating electricity. There's lots of other ways of generating electricity. And I suppose fair to say that I'm I'm not really very much in favor of nuclear power. But having said that, I'm also a scientist. And for scientists, the most important thing is to stick close to the evidence. In other words, if the evidence points in a certain direction, then check the evidence. Make sure it's the best evidence. And if that means you have to change your views, so be it. But with childhood leukemias, it's always led me to be more and more sure that uh, my initial premise was right. Um, So for that reason, I'm quite happy about being in and sticking close to the evidence, because that evidence really does show that there are increased leukemias near nuclear reactors. To be clear, you did not do a study on the childhood leukemias showing up around nuclear power plants, but you did compile existing studies and existing statistics. How extensive were those, and what led you to take this particular approach? Well, to actually carry out an epidemiological study takes a lot of time and a lot of money, and you have to have access to a lot of data. And oftentimes our data data is proprietary, and you can't get it yourself. You have to rely on other people getting it and giving it to you. On the other hand, there were over 60 studies worldwide on this particular issue of childhood leukemias near nuclear power plants. And that, in itself, provided uh, enough data for me to do my work properly. Um, 60 studies is a lot of studies, and there was a lot of data in those studies. And so that was by far the best thing to do, was to mine the existing data rather than actually uh, carry out a study from de novo, so to speak, using new data. Explain to us the extent of the danger that you discovered in doing this compilation of existing research. By the way, I should say that I I collaborated in a lot of this with a a German scientist called Dr. Alfred Kerblein, and he will crop up a lot in in my work. What we found when we were doing this work together was, first of all, the large number of studies. I mean, 60 studies worldwide. In toxicology... This is probably one of the biggest areas that's ever been studied. For example, if you were to look at asbestos or chemicals or lead poisoning or anything like that, there's nowhere near 60 studies on health effects from particular plants. So this, this is a very large number. The second thing is that we could do what are called meta-analysis. In other words, what you do is you, by careful examination of the data, you can add the data together. You've got to be sure that you're adding oranges to oranges and not apples and oranges, but you can do it. And when we've done that, you can get meta-analysis. Other people have done the same, by the way, and they all come up with the same answer, and that is that there are increased leukemias near nuclear power stations. It's beyond, the thing is, it's beyond doubt. There's a very clear pattern of raised childhood leukemias near the power station. There was one aspect in the article that you did cite where you combined the statistics, apparently mm-hmm. oranges to oranges, for Germany, Great Britain, Switzerland, and France into a single table. I was struck by the fact that what you came up with 
was 37% increase in childhood leukemias within five kilometers, which is about three miles from almost all nuclear power plants in these countries. That's right. Why had no one thought to compile these statistics before? And how alarming is this to you as a result that came from this? Well, the first thing is that the four governments, the scientists in those governments obviously knew that this was going on and they obviously knew that each of the four countries were doing this. Um, It's an obvious step for the data and the four studies to be added together. And I'm absolutely positive that the scientists, the relevant scientists in the four countries did it. In fact, we know them and we know they did it but they didn't publish the data. We did, and uh, Dr. Corbyn and I, we did it together, and very statistically significant uh, increases in childhood leukemias near all the reactors in those four countries. Not, not quite all the reactors. In France, there was only about uh, two-thirds of the reactors, but pretty well all of the reactors in the four countries. What conclusions can be drawn, or did you draw, from the compilation that you put together? Well, it was quite clear that there was an increase. It was beyond the bounds of chance. This wasn't a flip finding. This meant that it was clear that there were increases near NPPs and that we had to move on to the reasons for that and the energy policy consideration. When did you start this? The actual study itself was commissioned by the organizers of a conference in the UK in 2012. And myself and many other contributors uh, to the conference, that all their proceedings, all the proceedings of the conference were going to be published in a journal. The problem was that my article or my talk was very controversial. It resulted in a lot of delay in the peer review process. And as a result of that, the, the proceedings of the conference delayed by about two years. I understand that there was one scientist who shall remain nameless who challenged you repeatedly and extensively. Would you talk about what that was like for you and also how you responded to the various challenges that you received? The person concerned that I have known for many years He's a, a worthy adversary, shall we say. I have a lot of respect for his work, funny enough. Um, he's a good scientist, but we have different views about nuclear power. And it was a real tussle, shall we say. A long, drawn-out gladiatorial battle. <laughs> but it was on the basis of science, and we argued the toss about scientific evidence. And that took a long time over many pages of paper and many, many points. The editor of the journal, he was very good. He had to be a neutral referee in this, but he he was well informed. He knew about the issues and he knew what to allow, what not to allow. And so my congratulations go to him. A lot of other people would have ducked out on this. and But he saw it right through. And in the end, he published it. And his reward is that as a result of the publication, within about two or three months, um, about 500 people downloaded it, which in this, shall I say, uh, narrow subject area, is a lot of downloads. It's um, It's gone viral or partly viral. A good chunk of the readership of the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity must have downloaded the, the, the article. And for the editor, that is very heartening because that means he struck a chord and people are picking up on what he's published. So he was very happy indeed. There is one other thing I should mention, and that is that I I waited for about three months after the publication before I went onto the web uh, with my own blog on this. And that is to give time to readers to point out any errors or omissions or bits where I've got it wrong or whatever may be in the article. And to date, touch wood, there haven't been any at all. So that's given me a lot of confidence in the sense that even although I can imagine 
a lot of readers will be find this difficult to take. They haven't come up with anything which has sunk me below the waterline, so to speak. A shell hasn't landed below the waterline or anything like that. In fact, there haven't been any shells. So it's, uh, I'm quite pleased with that. And I'm relatively confident um, with the hypothesis now. It seems that the extensive challenges that you went through with your worthy scientific opponent helped you vet the article to the point where nobody could pick anything apart with it. How accurate would that be? <laughs> that would be very true. Yes, you're right. The fact that the, the peer review process was so tough and so prolonged basically meant that the article itself was pretty watertight. Now that we have this watertight article that correlates raised leukemia rates in children with proximity to nuclear power plants, what impact has what you've written had on public awareness in the media and on governmental policy? Well, it's really hard to say. Uh, what I do know is that amongst my colleagues and friends here in the UK and in Germany, they've more or less taken this on board and it's now accepted, certainly in the environmental community, that this is a serious matter that has to be taken on board and that building nuclear power stations really is very problematic now. As far as governments are concerned, now they deny it all the way. It's very difficult for them if they've decided that they're going down the nuclear line to find this evidence which directly contradicts it well, they, they reject the evidence, unfortunately. What do you think is going to happen here in the United States as more and more people become aware of this article and have the opportunity to read it? That's a good question. In the United States, the, right now, the National Research Council is about to embark on a big study of childhood cancers near U.S. reactors. And this is going to be quite important. There's about a 100 reactors in the United States, and if they get data for all those 100, that's going to be a fairly powerful study. Now, what this study that I've uh, produced says is that in the rest of the world, the evidence is crystal clear. There are increased leukemias near nuclear plant. So... I'm pretty sure that government scientists in the United States will have read the article. Indeed, given that the fact that there's been so many downloads, and my the consultant that looks after my, my website says, oh, uh, a good chunk of those, like about half, are from the United States, that means that the scientists who can in the United States may know about the study, for sure. So that, say... 200, 300 scientists in the United States have downloaded this and have read it. They must be aware uh, in government circles of this article, and it must figure somehow or other in their thinking. I'm not sure whether they will like the article in the sense that it's bad news for them, particularly in the Department of Energy in the United States, but nevertheless the evidence is there. There is one other thing, and that is that the United States Environmental Protection Agency is consulting on proposals to relax the limits for radiation doses from U.S. nuclear power stations. Well, this study flies right in the face of that. It says, if anything, it should be the other way around. It should be tightening, not relaxing radiation limits near U.S. reactors. So there's two things going on in the United States right now. Both of them are addressed by my article, and it's difficult for me to predict what's actually going to happen. I have a number of friends in the United States, um, quite a few in fact, and they have said to me that they are surprised and amazed at the findings in my study. They say that it has clear implications for what's going on in the United States. So my reaction would be, while well, the jury's still out, watch this space. Let's see what happens. To what extent do you think it would be possible for the U.S. to put together a study this massive and somehow come up with different results than what you came up with in examining 60 other studies? Well, the first thing is that 
if they do what we did, in other words, we restricted this to children under five, and also the exposure area to less than five kilometers, i.e. under three miles, it would be extremely surprising if they found out found anything different than we found. The reactors that we're talking about are the similar reactors to the United States, but uh, pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors. So it would be very difficult. One of the key things I'd like to mention to your uh, listeners is this. Up until 2012, we didn't really know what happened with the emissions from nuclear reactors. The only data that we had was annual data. In other words, so many becquerels or petabecquerels or gigabecquerels per annum from a reactor. We didn't really know the time pattern. Now we do. Now we know that the large majority, say two-thirds, three-quarters, of the annual emissions from a reactor occur just once during one spike. And that spike occurs when the reactor is opened up to take out the old fuel and to put in fresh fuel. And during that time period, about a day, day and a half, the reactors are depressurized. In other words, the huge pressures inside the reactor are, well, we open up the valves and the radioactive gases shoot out. It's during that time that we think that the people downwind are exposed to high levels of radioactivity, i.e. high radiation doses. And that phenomenon, in other words, that time signature of instead of having even little bits of uh, emissions throughout the 365 days, now you don't have that. You have one big massive spike, which happens over about a day and a half period. And that happens, roughly speaking, about once a year when the fuel rounds are taken out, the old ones, and, and the new ones are put in. So that's important, very, very important, because it results in doses which are at least 20 times higher and maybe even as much as 100 times higher. I discuss this in my article. So that, that's a major worry, and that's, that's something that's going to have to be addressed by both the US EPA and also the National Research Council in its future studies. They're going to have to address this big spike in emissions each year from every reactor. That's stunning because, of course, by averaging out over a year, it seems yes. like it would be a much lower thing. Dose. We wouldn't have to worry about it. It wouldn't be a dose that would be damaging, low level, blah, blah, blah. But what you're saying is that the majority of that happens at a predictable time when the fuel rods are being switched out and there is no notice, no awareness, no Correct. sirens going off, no protection, no Correct. awareness. Correct. Indeed, I've said to a number of nuclear operators, look, why don't you do this at nighttime when people are in bed? Mm-hmm. Why don't you do it when it's really, really windy out uh, and it's dr- not raining? Uh, the rain brings the radionuclides back to Earth. When, but when it's windy, you get massive dispersion. But if it's very calm, then it just drifts everywhere and you get big doses. No response. Libby, there's one other thing I'd like, a little story I'd like to tell you, which might interest your readers. This time pattern, these spikes, have been hidden from us ever since the beginning of the nuclear power program back in the 1950s or late 50s, early 60s, nobody knew about them, apart from the people who worked in the nuclear industry, and they kept really quiet about it. What happened was that some German scientists who were anti-nuclear began to suspect that there was something funny going on here. So back in 2012, when the regional government of Baden-Württemberg became red-green. By red-green, I mean it was governed by a coalition of socialist and green parties, rather than the, how shall I say, the 
the Christian Democrats who are sort of more conservative in their views. The first thing they did was this, this German red-green coalition um, was that they demanded their nuclear regulator give them data, give the minister, the, the energy minister, data on the half-hourly emissions from the nuclear power plants in their area in Baden-Württemberg. This is intriguing. The energy minister was a woman. I'm afraid I've forgotten her name, and I haven't got it written down, but she was a very powerful and determined lady. And the head of the region's uh, nuclear regulatory commission refused to give the information and said, no, we don't have it. But from an insider, we knew that they did have it. And so the German energy minister said, you will put this data on my desk on Monday morning or you will be fired. And he said, I don't believe you. And she said, right, I want on my desk on Friday afternoon your resignation letter undated. And he had to bring his letter, resignation letter, undated, and she put it in the drawer and said, right, if I don't get this information on Monday morning, I am putting a date on this letter. That's what she did. And then she was playing hardball. Um, we got the data, but the trouble is that the data was presented in a computer program form format that we, nobody had apart from the nuclear industry. So we demanded um, the data in a sort of user-friendly form, and they said, no, you asked for the data, you got it. We're not helping you anymore. And she was about to sack the regulator when some people in the Green Party who were computer wizards said, look, we can put this this data into a computer program, shall we call it A, and then transfer that to a computer program B, and then transfer it to... Microsoft Excel. And once we get it into Excel, we can read off the data. It took them about three days to do it, but they got it. <laughs> I love it. And then we got the data, and for the first time we saw what was happening, a massive spike, a thousand times higher in terms of concentration than the normal amount. In other words, instead of three becquerels per cubic meter, we were finding 3,000 becquerels per cubic meter. In other words, a thousand-fold increase. And then we knew what was going on. And then we knew, because it had tried, it had hit this since the start of the nuclear power program. Well, that's that, 50 years ago. They've hidden this, and it went to great lengths to prevent us from getting the information. And now we've got it. Now, what I'd like to say to your American listeners is, This is very important. You have to go to your regulators and say, there's no reason why this is not occurring also in UK and US reactors. These data are from pressurized water reactors at Gundremigen in uh, Baden-Württemberg in Germany. And so we know that it's very, very likely the same is happening with US reactors. So what are you going to do about it? That's the wake-up call that I'd like to issue to your uh, listeners, and I hope that uh, at least some of you, some of your listeners, will pick this up and say, whoa, we've got to do something here. It's a powerful piece of information. And Mm. the fact that they knew, that the industry knew about these spikes and went to such great lengths to hide it means that they understood exactly how devastating that information would be to yes. their business and their financial futures. So, of course, they would do everything in their power to hide it. And good for those people in Germany and that environmental minister and you for getting this information, putting it in a usable form so that we have the opportunity to now use this as a very important piece of weaponry, as it were, on behalf of getting these things shut down and taken care of. So if someone hears this interview or reads your article and realizes that they are living in proximity to a nuclear reactor and they either have or they want to have children, what would you recommend that they do? 
I've already done this in Canada, in fact, where they've got uh, nuclear reactors, you wouldn't believe, in uh, metropolitan Toronto. It's absolutely crazy. I'm Canadian, so I don't have any joy in saying what I say, but the Ontario government really has got to get a grip of this. And I have said in guidance to Greenpeace Canada that women of childbearing age who wish uh, or intend to have families, or even if they've got young ones, or if they're already pregnant, they shouldn't live within 10 kilometers of a reactor. And that people who already live near nuclear reactors and have gardens, they shouldn't eat their own produce if they live within five kilometers. And I've actually given that evidence, and it's published on my website and evidence to Greenpeace Canada. So my advice to this would be to young women who are living in the shadow of nuclear reactors is don't do it. Ian, if people wish to download a complete copy of your article, how could they do that? Difficult. It's behind a very stiff paywall. Um, my guidance to people who need a full copy for research purposes would be to contact me. And um, it's permissible under the copyright laws to send individual copies to scientific researchers. You can do that. What is not permissible is for somebody to get a copy then immediately uh, send it around to hundreds of other people. That is not allowed, I'm afraid, under our present copyright arrangements. Um, for those people who are not scientific researchers, my guidance to them would be, do they know anybody who works as a scientist in a, an academic institution, a university in the United States, or do they live near a big national library, either in Washington, D.C., or New York, or L.A., or near the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, or the Berkeley Laboratories, or any of the National Research Institutes, because they will have copies of these journals, and they will have a copy of the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity online. Uh, so if they have any friends in universities at all, they will be able to, to, to get them, ask them to download for them. It's not ideal. The present paywall arrangements are uh, unfortunate, um, but it's how the large publishing companies make their living. So that's my best guidance. Ian, anything you would like to add at this point that we haven't covered? I haven't mentioned the name of the organization in Germany which got the data of the emission spikes. It's called IPPNW, and that stands for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. IPPNW. They're a a large international organization based, their headquarters are in Boston, in Massachusetts. They're a good organization. My hats go off to IPPNW because they were the people that got the data. And IPPNW also provided me with Dr. Alex Rosen, who yes. in Nuclear Hot Seat number 161, I had the opportunity yes. to interview him about the UNSCIR report which yes. he took apart point by point. It has gone viral. It has been picked up by e, &E News and elsewhere and has become one of the most important interviews that I have done. This one ranks up there as well because right. what you're providing us is with the hardcore scientific evidence that we can use to say we're not a bunch of emotional tree-hugging environmentalists, <laughs> though we may be in our spare time, but we also have the data to back up what it Absolutely. is that we are saying. My study provides a lot of ammunition. It really does. And try and get a hold of it. And uh, if there are people who desperately, who really do need to have this, for example, they have children who live very close to a nuclear reactor, I will send them the, the article, I will, so that they can use it to obtain some sort of redress. I have given evidence in Canada to various public hearings, uh, governmental inquiries and stuff like that. And I'm quite prepared to do that in the United States. Uh, 
here I am, ready, willing, and able to help out in any way that I can for the forthcoming, there's two struggles now. One is the National Research Council study, and secondly is the US EPA proposals to weaken uh, the safety limits. Ian, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Uh, it's a pleasure from mine, and uh, best wishes to all the uh, campaigners uh, who are opposing the nuclear juggernaut, as you say, in the United States. And I'd like to say to you, too, uh, well done, and uh, I hope that uh, we can certainly keep in touch. Dr. Ian Fairley. You can find a link to his article on the study on childhood leukemia rates in proximity to nuclear reactors on our website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode number 165. You can also follow him on his blog, infairly.org, I-A-N-F-A-I-R-L-I-E dot org. Just click on the News and Comments tab. The John Stewart Twitter campaign to get Nuclear Hot Seat on his show is up and running still on the website nuclearhotseat.com slash blog. All the info is available there as to how you can participate. And remember that my e-book, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is available on amazon.com. Check it out. Here's today's final thought. I just learned of the death of a woman I knew through my storytelling group. You couldn't say we were friends, but we were friendly, and even socialized a few times outside of our Wednesday night time at the mic. Her death was sudden, unexpected, at least by me. And it haunts me, because, as so many Facebook posters pointed out, she died of lung cancer, even though she wasn't even a smoker. Followers of the nuclear issue are probably familiar with Dr. Helen Caldicott's quote that inhaling a millionth of a gram of plutonium will give you lung cancer. Some of you have also seen the x-ray of the lung of a chimpanzee that was intentionally exposed to plutonium and the resulting tumor and effect on the lung tissue. Fukushima shot nuclear materials, including plutonium, into the jet stream and they were part of the plume that traveled across the Pacific Ocean to hit the west coast of North America, beginning eight days after the disaster began. This woman, who was not exactly a part of my life, but tangential to it, lived on the west coast, in Los Angeles. And so I wonder, did she inhale a millionth of a gram of plutonium? Was she a victim of Fukushima? A friend of mine, a virtual brother with whom I've shared times both good and horrid, lives on the west side of Los Angeles, not far from the ocean. He would engage with me in the nuclear conversation when we met, but more as a matter of love and support for me, not through any reigning passion of his own. He has developed cancer of the tongue, not a common cancer. He is neither a smoker nor a chewer of tobacco. In an ugly stroke of irony, he's a caterer. And now, because of the radiation treatments he's had to endure, he can neither taste anything nor speak very well. And so I wonder, is he a victim of Fukushima? At the wedding of a man I've known for more than 30 years to his lover of more than a decade, I met a friend of theirs who was in mourning. His niece, I forget her age, but I think she was maybe six or so, had just died after a long, protracted battle with what he only described as a rare cancer. When he heard that I produced this show and had been at Three Mile Island and considered myself an activist on this issue, he explained to me that the girl's family lived in his childhood home in Illinois, As when he and his siblings had been children, these kids would spend hot summer days swimming in the river adjacent to the property. Only this man swam in the river back in the 1950s, before the nuclear reactor was built less than 10 miles upstream. I was the only person he needed to ask, and so he asked me, with desperation in his eyes and his voice, Is it 
possible? And before he could finish his question, I said, yes. There is a nuclear elephant in our collective living room. It menaces us. It haunts us. It strikes without warning and leaves not a trace unless we, like Sherlock Holmes, know how to spot the clues and follow them to their obvious to us. Conclusion. The death toll, the roll call of the injured and dying from Fukushima and other nuclear ill-considered construction is nowhere near complete. It will never be complete just continually and invisibly evolving, growing. As we heard from Dr. Farrelly's interview, the nuclear industry intentionally disguises, confuses, obfuscates, and withholds the evidence of its devastation, and has since its very inception. The only way the truth about nuclear will ever get out is if and when we activists find ways to force the industry and those who support it, to accountability. And not only the nuclear industry doesn't want to hear from us, I got plenty of flack on Facebook for bringing up the N-word, nuclear, as a possible connection to the storyteller's death. It seems that nobody wants to hear it. Doesn't mean that radiation's not there. Doesn't mean that ignorance will protect any of us from the impact of radiation on the body. It just means that those of us who do know and understand and fight our despair with anger and action must find better, more persuasive ways to get our message across. I'd like to say that these deaths, this illness, are the last of the negative impact from nuclear on people in or around my life. Except I'm a realist. No way. Not even close. This is only the start. Time to get Dr. Fairley's report into the hands of every legislator, every regulator, every member of Congress, every supporter of nuclear, every reporter and producer we can. Time to get busy. Time to make that elephant visible. While we still have the time to do so. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 19, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, IRSN News Magazine, the French Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety, Crystal Kids Radio, Dr. Andrew S. Cantor of Physicians for Social Responsibility, CBS Radio on the Coast, a greenroad.blogspot.com, WTNH, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Residents Organized for a Safe Environment.org, San Onofre Safety.org, Daily Press, The Horse, Press Enterprise, Radio Australia.net, News.com.au, World Nuclear News, Dianukes.org, and the ever popular Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Please, if you haven't already, friend us, join us, and tweet to John Stewart about us. Theme music for Nuclear Hot Seat, written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under Podcasts and on the newly searchable website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. I do not necessarily reply to you immediately, but I will get back to you when I'm interested in the story and wish to follow up. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit and not-for-profit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse, granted, as long as proper attribution is provided, meaning my name and the website. If you are a for-profit endeavor, just let me know, and we'll talk about it and figure out something that works for us both. This is Libby Halevi of Heart History Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, 
reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call.